James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. The prayer of faith. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. This is the word of the Lord. If the kiddos want to go with Miss Janet, now's a great time for you to go with Miss Janet. Y'all, this is the last sermon in the James series, and, and I've got to be partial for a moment. I've really enjoyed this series. It's been a fun one, uh, walking through James. Uh, I know I'm biased, but I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have going through James. Um, James chapter 5, you know, you heard uh, Liam read kind of the theme, set it up for us. Uh, but I'm actually going to jump over to a story from Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, a story that pairs uh, very well with that, that, those ideas that James presents in James chapter 5. So let's start by praying together, though. Father, we are thankful for your goodness. It's always running after us. It's always speaking to us. God, we do believe your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So come now, God, speak to us. Come now, chase after us with your goodness. Help us to hear. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Hear the word of God from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 20 and 25 through 26. One day, while Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby See, they had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Just then, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Immediately he stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went to his home glorifying God. Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen strange things today. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I remember way back when we were all just kids. You know, we'd run through the streets and the alleys, chasing after each other down those, those alleyways in Capernaum. And I still remember the favorite game that we, we played. You see, the race, it would always start on the north side of, of town, and it would end there at the Sea of Galilee on the south of Capernaum. But there was always a catch to the little game we played. You see, every kid in the race, we, we had to stop in the market and buy bread and fish before we made it to the seaside. It was our fun little way of setting up a picnic before we got there to the water. And I can still remember the day, though, that I forgot to bring my bag to carry my lunch in. So, so, so there I... I I found myself having to carry a slimy fish in the middle of a race without any bag. And of course, Andrew just looked at me and busted out laughing as soon as we got to the market. I mean, have you ever tried to hold a slimy fish and run in the market streets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. flopping everywhere, fish oil getting in your face. Yeah, this was my life in the middle of that, that race. Of course, I hadn't even bought my bread yet. So two hands on this fish wasn't going to work because I had to have one hand on the bread. Andrew, he just laughed and laughed and laughed. Of course, I'm there fumbling, looking like a fool on the streets, coming in last place in our little childhood race. 
know, there were six of us in all, six of us, us boys, six of us guys who ran together. Andrew, myself, Simon, James, Caleb, and then there was Aaron. See, Aaron was the joy of us all. Aaron was the, the one who kept us boys together. Aaron was our, our fearless leader. But you see, those, those days were over 30 years ago. Yeah, Aaron has lived quite a, quite a different life than those early days of us barreling through the streets of Capernaum. And no one really knows what exactly happened to Aaron. I mean, doctor after doctor tried to diagnose his condition, but, but not a single one could give any answer. And since we were all 12 years old, Aaron hasn't been able to walk. But he ar hardly ever let that get his spirits down. Not, not Aaron, not the Aaron I've known. I mean, I'd often lose faith, but Aaron would be the one to come and pick me up along the way. In fact, after the incident, Aaron seemed to become even more committed in his faith to God. And he swept all of us boys there along with him. We've never stopped praying for Aaron's healing, not, not ever across these whole 30 years. Now, I, I can say that my faith has certainly faltered a time or two looking back. We've all, you know, seen a few rough patches along the way. But being with those other five men, you know, it's always been a firm foundation. Their faith in God's faithfulness seems like it always picks me up, inspires my own faith along the way. You know, recently, God gave us a, a huge gift of grace-filled hope. See, rumors of, of a rabbi named, named Jesus have spread through Capernaum these past three years. Some say he moved into town from Nazareth. But he stayed quiet until just recently. And just in the last six months, I've heard this Jesus speak twice in synagogue. You know, relatives of mine, they, they say they, they've seen him perform miracles but none of us six guys have ever caught him in the act. And when I heard him preach through, you got to know, when I heard him preach, something stirred deep inside of me when I heard him preach. I mean, it was the strangest feeling. I, I could have sworn he preached right to my own very soul. It was like he was looking me straight in the eyes as he talked. It was like he, he knew me my entire life through. And some of the Jewish leaders, they, they tell us we shouldn't follow him. They say this Jesus speaks heresies. They say he's not a true rabbi, not truly sent by God. But if they're right, if they are right, why do I feel such peace in my spirit when I hear him speak? If they're right, how could the blind receive sight from a simple word. If they're right, how could the sick be healed by his prayers? I mean, if these Pharisee religious leaders are right, how come the Pharisees keep sending more and more teachers of the law just to hear him speak? See, that's when God put our faith to an active test. Verse 17. One day, while Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of law were sitting nearby. They'd come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. Just then, some men came, carry, carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. You see, we decided to, to carry Aaron to Jesus. I mean, God could surely heal our friend. We just knew it. And Jesus spoke like... The 
the crowd was, was far larger than we ever even imagined. And not only did it seem like all 1,500 residents of Capernaum had gathered around that small mud-framed home, but there were also Pharisee leaders who came even as far as Jer Jerusalem. Caleb and James, when they, when they saw the crowd, they just wanted to give up entirely on our plan. Something in the rest of us, something in the rest of us stirred deep inside. We just had to find a way. We, we just had to get in front of Jesus. I mean, this was our only chance. And our faith was so real in that moment. That's when a crazy idea hit us. Verse 19. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Yet just as we got to the top step, it finally hit me what we were doing. We would have to break through our neighbor's roof just to make our plan reality. But, but I gotta tell you, by that moment, our faith was already through the roof. We'd waited and prayed for 30 years. I mean, Jesus was, was surely God's answer to that prayer. We just couldn't let that moment pass. So there we found ourselves, destroying public property. <laughs> On our hands and, and knees, we, we broke through that roof, tile by tile, board by board. It felt like every year of the past 30 was being stripped away with every single grab broke through that mortar and clay as we, we finally got near and near to the light. Now finally I saw the, the roof split open. And I could see the rabbi's eyes. I expected, I fully expected to see anger and frustration in the rabbi's eyes. I mean, our, our little publicity stunt had, had stopped his teaching mid-sentence. Those eyes, they, they glanced our way with such a different look than I ever expected. It was curiosity. It was joy. It was this deep, deep love. A sideways smile of someone impressed by what they saw. As we lowered Aaron to the floor, that's, that's when Jesus spoke. Verse 20. When he saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. I say to you, stand up and take your bed and go to your home. When he saw their faith, when he saw their faith, you see, to me, that's the most mysterious part of this, this whole story. Of course, I, I like to imagine the, the men who carry him in and their backstory get a little bit, bit imaginative in, in my telling. But to me, the most mysterious part is when Jesus is looking at this man, it's the faith of his friends that stands out to him. Jesus heals this paralyzed man, man when he sees the faith of his friends. Scripture says it plain, when he saw their faith. Yeah, there's something healing about a family of faith. There's something God ordained about, about grace-filled friendships. Now, I don't really need to tell you this, because of all people, San Augustine people are people who really know what I'm getting at. I mean, how many of us here have lived in a busy metroplex area where the world is, is far more about the rat race, far more about every man for themselves, far more about individualism than what we see in this small town. I mean, of all people, I think St. Augustine people understand what community friendships are about. I actually found out about a month ago, my dad was looking at retirement property out here. <laughs> you know, St. Augustine, it surely isn't perfect. It's surely not perfect. 
there's much more of a, a, a family feel here in this small town than many other places in the world that we could live. There's a certain strength to that type of community. There's a healing grace when, when we build deep bonds of faith-filled friendships. You know, in all our searching and striving for living our, our, our best life. Oftentimes this community-focused idea, though, even in St. Augustine, this community-focused idea of gospel healing, it can actually get exceedingly easy to forget about. To forget about our need for community. To forget about the strength that community provides. And part of us, when we think about our faith, our faith in God, we say it exactly that way. Our faith, my faith in God. We tend to think about healing as all about our, ourselves, all about our individual faith and our personal prayers. And we don't often think about the faith of other people. We don't often think about how God may use the faith of other people in our lives. And yet when those friends in the story, when they break through the rooftop, the text is pretty clear. Jesus sees their faith, the faith of the paralyzed man's friends. And then he turns to the paralyzed man and heals. And the Apostle James actually says the same ideas in the passage from James chapter 5 that, that Liam read moments ago. James 5, 13 through 16. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. I think we need to pause a little bit and notice the, the community-shaped focus that James gives us there in James chapter 5. He says, are any among us sick or suffering or struggling through sin? What should they do? They should find the community. Let the people of God wrap arms around them, pray with them, hug their neck, speak honestly build friendships, pray for one another. And then James says something drastic, something I think we believe deep down, but we don't always live. He says this, he says, pray for one another so that you may be healed. When Jesus saw the faith of the friends, pray for one another so that you may be healed. See, it's the gathering together of a faith-filled community that often becomes the very gospel healing that we so desperately seek. And friends, that is a faith that works. You know, this series has been all about that idea of a faith that really works, a faith that will give us, get us through the nitty-gritty of life. That's a faith that will work kind of faith where Jesus looks at those friends and says, I'm seeing their faith. I'm seeing their faith. You know, it's crazy though, we often think of faith so individualized, so separate from community as if we have no need to gather. So privately about me, myself, and I as if it's only what prayers I pray, only what service to God I give. What I believe about my faith for my self-benefit. That's normally how we think about faith. You see, God gives us quite the opposite path towards healing. It's not just in that story from Luke. It's there in James. It's all over the scripture. When Jesus forms the church, he forms the church. He gives us a place to be a family. 
gives us a place to find the gospel in the eyes of each other. See, we need community. <laughs> we need people praying for us. We need people to link hand in hand with us when those times of trouble come our way, because they will come our way. We need faith-filled friends to challenge us towards holiness, to pick us up, to call us out when sin starts knocking on our door. We need those, those kind of friends who will break through the roof just to lay us at the feet of Jesus. That's the kind of friends we need. And as difficult as community can often be, how many times have you ever been in a perfect church? <laughs> I've never seen one, never seen a, a perfect church. But I have seen the people of God in the church. I have seen the gospel changing lives from another person encouraging them. I have seen people praying for each other and healing beyond explanation coming. I have seen people breaking through the roof just to lay me at the feet of Jesus. I've seen that. And that is gospel. That is gospel healing we desperately need. That is gospel healing that will get us through the grit of life. So today I give God thanks for that. I give God thanks that when Christ died and rose again and ascended into heaven, he didn't leave us on our own. But he wrapped us all up together in a thing called family. A thing we don't always get right, but a beautiful gospel promise at that. So may we sink ourselves into it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.